So thanks for the introduction. Um, today, I'm going to give you a sense of um, the applications of quantum entanglement in communication theory, as well as uh, cryptography. Um, so let's start from the basics. Um, many of you may already know this, but let's still start from the basics. What is entanglement? It's really a key aspect of uh, quantum information that separates it from classical information. Um, you can think of it as a kind of super correlation that two parties can share. You know, they each have to have some, some particle of, a, of at least a two particle state. Okay. Um, one thing about entanglement is that uh, we think of it in terms of what it is not. It cannot be created by what's called local operations and classical communication. And in that sense, it's, it's like a resource. The resource theory of entanglement has a long history, and it started with a famous paper of Charlie Bennett, um, David DiVincenzo, uh, Benjamin Schumacher. Oh, no, no, sorry. That was uh, John Smolin and Bill Wooters. It was actually uh, John Smolin's PhD thesis a long time ago, back in 1996. Okay, and indeed, it's important had been identified by Schrodinger in a foundational sense a long time ago. This is a famous quote. Maybe some of you have seen it already, but if you haven't, it's very interesting to read. I would not call that one, but rather the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics the one that enforces its entire departure from classical lines of thought. So um, the mathematical definition of entanglement is this. Um, we say it's entangled if it cannot be written as a separable state. So what is a separable state? It is a, it's a density operator, a bipartite, a two-party density operator, that is a probabilistic mixture of product states. We also call this a convex combination of product states. So a state like this, um, it can be created um, without a quantum interaction needed between the two parties. So someone in the background can flip a coin or a die according to this probability distribution, get a classical outcome X, communicate that over a classical communication channel to Alice and Bob, who then based on the value of X, prepare a state sigma X and tau X. And you know, the resulting mixture looks like this. So what I described is a procedure by which separable states can be prepared by local operations and classical communication. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> an entangled state cannot be written like this. And furthermore, entanglement cannot be increased by these local operations of classical communication. That's a fundamental postulate for um, entanglement. Um, I'm not going to get into too many details about it, but it's actually a computationally difficult problem. If you're given a mathematical description of a bipartite state and your goal is to decide if it's separable or not, so you have to decide whether there exists a probability distribution in states such that the state can be written like this, that problem is computationally complex. So it's known to be NP hard. Um, so hard for classical com computers, uh, very likely hard for quantum computers as well. You can change the problem around to be, you know, you're given a description of a circuit that prepares a state, that prepares a bipartite state, and then you can ask, uh, is the state generated by the circuit separable or entangled? And that is also a hard problem. Um, that's a problem that's provably hard for quantum computers up to, you know, widely believed statements in complexity theory. Okay, the notion of entanglement generalizes to multiple parties, but today we're gonna focus on just 
two parties. So what is a basic form of entanglement that appears in many protocols? We call it the EBIT, the Bell state, or an EPR pair. It's this phi plus. This is the density operator for the state. This is the corresponding state vector. So the state vector is a superposition of two different possibilities um, in which the, the states are perfectly correlated with each other. Um, <clears throat> the closest classical analog of entanglement is a secret key, okay? And this is related to a concept called monogamy of entanglement. So um, to speak about that further, an entangled state like this is such that if you were to try to find an extension of this state, like what is a, a state of three parties such that the reduced state would be this Bell state, the only possible extension is one in which the third party is a tensor product, is in tensor product with A and B. And we're gonna show that more explicitly later, but what that implies is that the third party cannot figure out anything about the outcome of local measurements on A and B. And so um, a secret key is the, the classical version of a secret key, you know, a secret key is classical, is that the, the, the bits are both zero, zero or one, one with probability one half. So uniformly random, perfectly correlated, and furthermore, uh, independent of any third party. And so from an entangled state like this, you can prepare a secret key the reverse process is not possible. Okay, what is entanglement useful for these basic protocols? So I'm gonna talk about these basic protocols for a bit. Possibly you've seen these before, but these are really the starting point of quantum information theory. You know, these super dense coding was discovered in 1992 by Charlie Bennett and Steven Wiesner. Wiesner recently passed away. Teleportation was discovered a year later, very famous protocol. And these protocols taught us that the manipulation of quantum information is very different from the, the manipulation of classical information. And then I'll also talk briefly about the CHSH game. If you're interested in much more details about these, um, you know, of course, these are widely known things. Recently at LSU, I've been delivering, uh, I'm, I'm teaching a course on quantum information theory. If you go to markwildy.com slash teaching, you'll find the course and you'll find notes and videos up there uh, that I've recorded on Zoom. Okay, super dense coding, Alice and Bob are spatially separated and we assume that some source has distributed to them <coughs> this EBIT state, okay? And Alice wants to communicate two bits to Bob. And she can do so by encoding these bits via Pauli operations. So if this bit X2 is zero, she does nothing. If it's one, she'll perform Sigma X or just briefly X, okay? And then if x0, if x1 is zero, she does nothing. If x1 is one, she does Pauli Z. So what's very interesting is that by these local operations, Alice can rotate the global state to one of four, one of the four orthogonal bell states. Okay. And then if Alice transmits her share of the entanglement over a qubit channel. Bob can perform a bell measurement to figure out the value of these bits. This is the ideal case when the, the entanglement is perfect, when the qubit channel is perfect. And so, you know, we can ask reasonable and fundamental questions like, well, what if the entanglement is noisy? How well can they do? What if the qubit channel is noisy? How well they can do? And then that's what motivated ideas from quantum Shannon theory. So super dense coding was 1992 and about seven years later, Bennett, Shore, Smolin and others um, looked at uh, 
entanglement assisted communication over a noisy channel. And they figured out uh, the fundamental limits of communication in that scenario. But this is the basic SuperNets coding protocol. You can view it as a conversion of a qubit and an ebit. Those are like resources that you're consuming. And then from those resources, you produce two classical bits that can be communicated. Okay. Um, I also want to comment on a cryptographic aspect of SuperNets coding that's very interesting. Suppose that there's an eavesdropper tapping the line here. Um, then <clears throat> the reduced state here is actually independent of the bits that Alice transmitted. Um, it's, it's the maximum mixed state. And so if someone does not have access to this share of the entanglement, they cannot figure out anything about the bits that are being transmitted. All right. Um, sorry, excuse me. Okay, so teleportation can be viewed as a protocol where you swap what Alice and Bob are doing. So instead of, um, you know, Alice performing the bell measurement, sorry, instead of Bob performing the bell measurement, Alice does. And uh, Bob is the one who performs these local pally operations. So we assume that beforehand they share an EBIT as well. Some source has distributed that to them, but now the goal is different. The goal is to transmit a qubit from Alice to Bob. So Alice performs this bell measurement, um, which is a projection onto one of the four bell states. And then randomly, uh, one of four outcomes occurs. The probability for the outcomes to occur, it's these two bits, is uniformly random and independent of the state that you're trying to teleport. So you transmit these bits over communication channels, and then Bob does these corrections. And then at the end of the process, the state psi um, is, is destroyed on Alice's end and reproduced over here. Okay. And you can also view this as a resource conversion process. These two classical bits are being consumed. The E bit is being consumed. What's being generated is a qubit channel. This also has a cryptographic aspect to it. If there's an eavesdropper tapping the line here, then um, the two classical bits have nothing to do. Uh, like if you have the two classical bits, you cannot figure out anything about the state being transmitted. So that's very useful. And it's been employed in cryptographic protocols like measurement device independent quantum key distribution. Furthermore, if, the eaves, if an eavesdropper has access only to Bob's system, but not the classical bits, uh, this system here is in a maximally mixed state. And um, even after the measurement is performed, this, this system is still, this qubit is still in a maximally mixed state. And it's only after these bits are received that the reconstruction is possible. So from the perspective of quantum Shannon theory, we can also ask questions like, well, what if the state is noisy? How well can we do? What if we have many copies of the state? How well we can do? That is a, uh, that topic has been considered before and actually with a um, summer student this past summer, we, we were investigating this problem um, using concepts like uh, what's called K extendability and positive partial transpose, but I won't get into further detail about that. Okay, another use of entanglement is what's called the CHSH game. This is a very famous um, uh, setting in quantum information theory. It is the basic idea behind device independent quantum key distribution. This is a topic that's been considered a lot. And um, there, there's a PhD student working with me on that topic. We, we have a grant to investigate device independent quantum key distribution, uh, theoretical aspects of it. Anyway, the game is this. There's a referee who generates bits X and Y uniformly at random. So X and Y can take the value zero and one. 
And then Alice has to report back a single bit A, as well as Bob has to report back a single bit B. They win the game if the logical and of the inputs is equal to the exclusive or of the outputs. Okay. So what's very interesting about this and what re represents a sharp distinction between what's possible in classical information and what's possible in quantum information is you can prove that if Alice and Bob are allowed only shared randomness before the game begins, then their best winning probability is three fourths or 75% of the time. Whereas if they're allowed to share an entangled state, the maximally entangled state, the Bell state that we just talked about, and perform local measurements on it to determine the values of these bits, then they can win with probability cosine squared pi over eight, that's approximately 85%. So there's a very, um, you know, there's a gap. There's a 10% gap between what you can do in the classical case and what you can do in the quantum case. It's known, uh, there's a result called Cyrilson's bound after a person named Boris Cyrilson, that this cosine squared pi over eight is the best you can do in the CHSH game. You cannot achieve a higher winning probability than that. What's also very interesting is that there's a converse statement. So if you play this game many times and you find that uh, Alice and Bob are winning with probability 85% or near to 85%, then in fact, the only strategy that they could have been employing up to local unitaries is the, the strategy that achieves the 85%, where they're using a maximum entangled state and performing the measurements that achieve this winning probability. So that's very interesting, and that's the basis of device-independent QKD. Um, the idea is that you try to distribute entanglement over a quantum network uh, connecting Alice and Bob, and on some of the, the rounds, they perform tests in, form, in the form of the CHSH game. They pick those rounds randomly. And uh, you know if they find that they're winning 85% of the time, then you can infer that on the other rounds, uh, they, they have to be sharing the max, with high probability, they're sharing the maximum entangled state as well. And from those, rounds that are not the test rounds, they can extract secret key. Yes, so let's talk about the connection between entanglement and secret key further. This is what I was talking about earlier. If Alice and Bob share a maximally entangled state, this five plus, then there's something called the purification principle of quantum mechanics. It guarantees that the global state of their system and any other third party has this product form, okay? Where if Eve is a third party, which is any other person in the universe in principle, then the global state has to be a tensor product state. And Alice and Bob can then measure their, their qubits in the sigma Z, uh, you know, they can measure the sigma Z observable and get a secret qubit. So that, that, those, those, that secret key is perfectly correlated, like they either get zero, zero with probability one half or one, one with probability one half. And um, the, the outcomes are independent of Eve. So if they generate many, many entangled states and get a secret key, like an n bit secret key, those bits will be uh, selected uniformly at random and then it's hard to guess the value of the bits, right? If you're trying to guess an n bit uniformly random number, then you'll only be able to guess it with probability one over two to the n. And so the guessing probability decreases exponentially with the number of bits. And what's nice about um, a, a QKD protocol that's based on the CHSH game is um, the key is, guaranteed to be secure by uh, the laws of quantum mechanics, you know, the physical laws that we really believe in. Okay, 
So from here on out, um, I want to talk about entanglement in realistic systems. Um, how am I doing on time? I forgot to put my cell phone uh, near me. Anyone there? I can I can grab my cell phone real quick. Uh, just give me one second. Very twenty minutes into the talk, so about that twenty five more minutes. Twenty five more minutes. Great. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Just give me a heads up at around um, with maybe five minutes left. Sure. Good. Okay. Um, so the protocols that we discussed, teleportation and dense coding, they're ideal protocols. And we already asked, like, what if there's noise? So this leads to a wide variety of communication tasks, um, classical communication, entanglement assisted classical communication, which generalizes supernets coding. We can also ask about feedback, if the, if the receiver is allowed to send feedback to the sender, private communication, secret key agreement that's related to QKD, and quantum communication, which is essential for a future quantum internet. You know, one of the organizers of the workshop, Peter Rohde, has a recent book on the quantum internet where you can learn more about that. Okay, so it's nice to have an example of a communication channel in mind while we're thinking about these problems. And a very natural example is the lossy thermal channel. Okay, so what happens here is that Alice has an input mode of light and she's trying to communicate uh, information and code in that light over a, a potentially large distance to Bob. So along the way, there's gonna be loss. So some fraction eta of the signal will make it to Bob and some fraction one minus eta will be lost to the environment, okay? And then, um, so we can model loss in terms of an optical beam splitter. It's a basic interaction from quantum optics. And theta n is a thermal state that the environment could be injecting. You know, uh, that could be due to, um, you know, uh, if you're transmitting in free space, if there's thermal light from the sun that's interfering with what you're transmitting. Also, at the end of the communication scheme, you have to have a photon detector. If that has, if that counts photons um, when it when it should not be, that's called dark count. Then that can be modeled by thermal noise as well. So this big N is the number of thermal photons, the mean number, the mean number of thermal photons. If it's zero, it's said to be a pure loss channel. That's what I'm talking about here. And that, that model is often used uh, as well as an as a interesting model for loss. Okay, so the kind of diagram you should have in mind for the communication of classical bits is this. There's a message that Alice wants to transmit. She's allowed to perform some encoding and use the channel many times. So this big N you should think of as this thermal channel going from A to B. And we imagine they're allowed to use the channel many times. And this diagram indicates that the encoding could encode the message into an entangled state of um, these qubits or modes. And so then over here, Bob is receiving the, the corrupted information, the corrupted signal. And in general, we allow him to perform a collective measurement. You know, a classical scheme for communication would involve encoding the message into, for example, coherent states of light, the light produced by a laser, and performing on each mode heterodyne detection, you know, which is a form of, of detection. And then that would induce a classical channel. <clears throat> and there would be a certain capacity for that channel uh, given by Shannon's theory. Uh, the capacity is like the ultimate rate at which communication is possible in the limit of many uses of the channel such that the error tends to zero. So, but in the quantum case, they're allowed, Bob is allowed to perform a collective measurement which could potentially achieve a much higher 
uh, rate of communication. So how does entanglement play a role? Well, we talked about using collective measurement to decode messages. Remember the bell measurement from supernet's coding with this diagram earlier. To, to figure out the bits that were transmitted, Bob had to do a joint measurement, and that is a projection onto the bell states. How would you do that in the lab? You would have to do a controlled knot, quantum interaction, Hadamard, and then measurements in the computational basis. So you're doing like a, a quantum computation and then product measurements to figure out the output. So that's what a collective measurement is. And um, yeah, so, so <clears throat> it's kind of like you have entanglement in the decoder because a, co a collective measurement involves a quantum computation, which um, you know, that quantum computation could be used to produce entanglement. The other way that entanglement comes into play is that these code words that are being transmitted could be entangled states. And there are channels for which enhancements are possible from entanglement. To give you some taste of the theory, um, to figure out the capacity of a channel, what you need to calculate is something called Halevo information. This is an information quantity that was invented by Halevo in the 1970s, and he proved various important statements about them, about this quantity. Um, so the Halevo information is a linear combination of von Neumann entropies. So the way you calculate it is you imagine that you have some ensemble of quantum states. So with probability P of X, a state rho X is chosen you send rho x into the channel, and then you get a joint density operator of this classical system x and a quantum system b. And then with respect to this state, you compute these entropies. Um, I don't have the formula for von Neumann entropy, but it's a very famous formula. It's uh, for a density operator rho, it's negative trace rho log rho. Okay, so then H of X is the entropy with respect to the reduced state of system X after tracing over B. Uh, H of B is the entropy of the state after tracing over system X and then calculating this entropy, um, et cetera. So that's the Halevo information. What is known about it is that it's an achievable rate for classical communication over a quantum channel. We don't have time to get into the reason why that's the case. If you're interested in that, you can consult the papers of Halevo Schumacher and Westmoreland, or you can read my book. Okay, what's known is that the capacity is equal to the regularized Halevo information. So you take the channel uh, tensor at n times, little n times, and then compute this quantity and divide by n and take a limit. So this is a formal mathematical expression for the capacity. It's difficult to compute in practice. However, for some channels, this limit is not needed. And so a lot of the, the problems in quantum Shannon theory revolve around figuring out, okay, when is this Halevo information additive such that the regularization is not necessary and the capacity is equal to this formula and when is it necessary? So what is known is that there exists a channel for which there's a strict inequality. You know, the Halevo information of the channel being used twice is greater than twice the individual Halevo information. What does this translate to in terms of um, a more operational or physical statement? It means that entanglement, the encoder can boost the capacity in principle for some channel. This inequality was shown by Matt Hastings building work on work of Andreas Winter and Patrick Hayding in uh, 2008. So it's still open to find an explicit example of a channel for which the super additivity holds. Um, indeed, there's no explicit example known. I'm going to show you some work that I've done on this topic of classical communication. You know, you might be interested in designing error correction codes 
for communicating classical information over a quantum channel. So uh, a number of years ago, Saikat Guha and I wrote a paper about polar codes for sending classical information over quantum channel, quantum channels. And um, these codes are, you know, explicit codes that can achieve the capacity. We built on work of uh, Ari Khan, who did work on polar codes for, for classical information theory. And his work was the first to show that um, there's an explicit scheme for achieving capacity of a classical channel. And then some years later, he won the Shannon Award from the information theory community. So we realized that that work was very important and uh, we generalized it to the, the quantum case. Saikat is now a professor at University of Arizona and he, ha he heads up a center for quantum networks at University of Arizona in the US. And he has plenty of funding. And so you should consider applying to him um, to do research. Another work that I did with Saikat was for the pure loss channel. You know, we said that in principle, a collective measurement can be performed to achieve capacity. Well, a very natural question is, well, what is that measurement? How do you implement it? And so we had some work in 2012 where we addressed this question uh, in this paper. And we showed that we, we, we showed that the problem boils down to can you perform a measurement that projects onto the all vacuum state of n modes, of n optical modes, or um, projects onto the complement? And it's very important for this capacity achieving scheme that if you know the not vacuum case, the post measurement state has the vacuum subtracted out. You know, um, so it's it's very challenging to implement this measurement experimentally, and there's still questions remaining there about how to implement that. Okay, as a technical tool that we use to prove these results. This is an interesting generalization of the union bounds from probability theory. There were a number of papers that contributed to this direction initially by Pranab Sen, then by uh, a Chinese researcher, Jing Liang Gao, and then um, with my Iranian colleague, uh, Samad Askuzay, and an Italian colleague, Stefano, we, we um, improved the union bounds in this paper. So what does it say? If you have a sequence of projectors, and these could be used for decoding, you know, you, the decoder would be, you'd ask, is it the first code word? Is it the second code word? Is it the third code word? You could perform these measurements sequentially. And those are binary questions. And so there's a probability that a correct sequence of outcomes would occur that corresponds to this probability that you can calculate using the Born rule. And so the error probability is one minus that. And what we proved or, or what was shown in, in uh, Gao's paper, and then we had an extension of it here, is that uh, this error probability is bounded from above by the summation of the individual error probabilities with a factor of four in front. Uh, for the classical case, you don't need the factor of four, but for the quantum case, there's a recent paper that came out um, called uh, quantum union bound made easy, where they showed that this factor of four is in fact necessary for the quantum case. Okay, for the pure loss channel, there can be um, tremendous performance gains that you get by performing these um, collective measurements. So what we're showing here is rate bits per channel use versus the photon number that you're allowed to use as the input. So where you really get a big performance gain is the low photon number regime. So the red line is what, the, the red line is the quantum limit. It's also called the Halevo rate. And then these other lines are what you can achieve using classical schemes such as Helmandine or heterodyne detection. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, I think I'll skip this and talk about um, let's see. No, I, I think I'll show you this. I think it's, I think it's interesting. Okay. 
So you might ask, um, what if there's a feedback channel connecting the receiver to the sender? And what if it's a classical feedback channel? So this is some recent work that we've been doing. Uh, this was actually in collaboration with, with Peter Shore. I was working with some young graduate students who were very bold and uh, visited MIT and approached Peter Shore there. And then we got to collaborate with him. And you know, he, he did some early work in quantum Shannon theory. And so he's very interested in this, these kinds of questions in addition to quantum algorithms. So um, this is what the scheme looks like. There's a message that Alice wants to communicate. Um, the green lines indicate classical feedback. So the message that Alice wants to communicate is correlated with a quantum system that Alice can, com can combine via some encoding with the classical feedback to produce a quantum system that can be sent into the channel <clears throat> and there's a local quantum memory system. And then this is the system that appears at the output of the channel. And then Bob can do some local operation, send a classical feedback to Alice, and then this process continues, okay? And so locally, we assume that Alice and Bob have quantum computers that they can store the, the quantum information. And the capacity is defined similarly. You know, you're, you're allowed to use the channel many times, and then we're interested in the highest rate at which communication is possible, such that the error tends to zero as the number of channel uses goes to infinity. So how does entanglement play a role? Well, this includes the unassisted communication scenario as a special case, but there are interesting things that can happen in, in the quantum case. So like if the channel has some ability to generate entanglement, then that entanglement generated can be used in conjunction with the feedback for super dense coding. Um, uh, yeah, so, so <clears throat> what, what's, what's very interesting for the quantum case is that, you know, many years ago, Shannon proved that classical feedback does not enhance capacity. But in 2009, Graham Smith and John Smolin came up with a, a quantum communication scheme for, they came up with a quantum channel for which classical feedback can dramatically enhance capacity. What they showed is that there's an example of a channel for which the unassisted capacity is no more than two bits per channel use, whereas um, the assisted capacity uh, can be proportional to the logarithm of the dimension of the channel. So in principle, if the dimension of the channel gets very large, the capacity can be unbounded. So that's very interesting. So what I've been interested in my work is obtaining upper bounds on the feedback assisted capacity. So these are the recent papers that we uh, co-authored with Peter Shore, where we came up with different methods for bounding capacity. One of the ideas here was to use ideas from entanglement theory, like in entanglement measures to bound the capacity. And then um, in this paper, we used more complex ideas related to semi-definite programming. But a key idea that we use in our work is a quantum generalization of a classical concept. So there's the there's a distinguishability measure called Renyi relative entropy. And this is a quantum generalization of it that we came up with in 2013. There was an independent work of Marco Tom Michel and his co-authors where they defined this quantity as well. And one thing that we showed is that it obeys the data processing inequality. So under the action of a channel, the distinguishability measure does not increase. If ever you propose a distinguishability measure, um, this is the basic property that it must obey in order to be considered a distinguishability measure. So we use this tool to come up with upper bounds on the feedback assisted capacity. And um, Here's a plot where we look at a, an example of a channel. So rate versus depolarizing probability. So what is a depolarizing channel? It's a qubit channel where the qubit gets through with probability one minus P or the qubit state is replaced with a random noise maximum mixed state with probability P. So this blue line is the um, unassisted capacity 
that's the Halevo information. And you see, you know, if P is zero, then the, the channel is a perfect channel. So it's one qubit per use of a qubit channel. And as P goes to um, one, the capacity becomes zero. But in between is where the interesting action happens. So this red line is our upper, is our recent upper bound. You know, and this is the best known upper bound on the feedback assisted capacity of the depolarizing channel. When the channel becomes entanglement breaking, it's actually known that um, feedback does not increase capacity. And so this, this is actually the capacity. And so for future work, it would be great to reduce this gap. You know, <coughs> I don't know how to do it, but that would be very interesting as a future research direction. How am I doing on time now? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, so let me let me kind of um, skip some stuff. I want to talk about uh, quantum communication because I think that's of of great interest. So, quantum communication, the kind of diagram that we study, it looks similar to the previous one for unassisted, but now this A system is a is a quantum system, and in principle, this quantum system could be entangled with some reference system that's not available. The goal of a quantum communication protocol is to preserve the entanglement with the reference system. So by means of some encoding, the use of the channels, you know, decoding, you're trying to transfer this system over here such that the final state looks as close as possible to the initial state over here. How does entanglement play a role? Well, the goal is to preserve entanglement with the reference system. Um, there's this famous quote of John Preskill that uh, he's, it's in the Nielsen Chuang book. He says, uh, we've learned that we can fight entanglement with entanglement. What does that mean? Well, um, the quantum information being corrupted can be considered as it's getting entanglement. It's getting entangled with an environment system that's not available. Okay. So entanglement with the environment is bad because that can be considered as a source of dissipation or decoherence, okay? Um, but then what we know for quantum error correction is that if you take the state here and entangle it with auxiliary systems, then uh, that entanglement of the, the quantum information that's being transmitted can be used to fight the entanglement with the environment. And so that's like the basic principle behind quantum error correction. Okay. So I wanna give you a sense of the formula for quantum capacity. This is a, a very interesting um, expression. It's called the coherent information of a quantum channel. It's a difference of the entropy. So you take a pure state, send the A, you take a pure state phi and send the A system through the channel and that makes a bipartite state on a reference system and the output channel output system B. You compute the entropy of the reduced state on the B system, subtract the joint entropy and you get a quantity called coherent information, okay? In the classical case, this quantity is never uh, strictly positive, it's either zero or negative. But in the quantum case, um, this can go, this can be positive and it's positive if, um, you know, it can be positive when omega is an entangled state. And so this kind of um, measure of entanglement is fundamentally related to the rate at which you can communicate quantum information over a channel. So like the unassisted classical communication case, you can take this formula, regularize it, and then this is a formal mathematical expression for the quantum capacity of a channel. That's been known for a long time. There's no better formula known. Um, for some channels of interest, again, the regularization is not needed, okay? Um, so a lot of the research in quantum Shannon theory revolves around understanding this formula. There's a, 
amazing effect that occurs that is in distinction to classical information theory. This was discovered by Graham Smith and uh, John Yard. It's known that there exist quantum channels for which individually the quantum capacity is zero, but if you use the channels together, the quantum capacity can be strictly greater than zero. That's called superactivation of quantum capacity. Um, the channels for which this effect is known to occur, um, they have an explicit form and the channels themselves can be realized experimentally. I should make a, a clarification here. Um, to demonstrate the superactivation effect, you would, you would need to consider using the channels many times and doing local encodings and decodings. And you, you basically need a quantum computer to do that. So it's gonna be hard to do that in practice. Okay, let me, um, let me just essentially wrap up here. Okay, there are some other things that I had on the slides. Um, let me advertise these books that I've written. So I wrote a textbook about a decade ago called Quantum Information Theory. And indeed, it's now become a, a standard reference used, used in graduate coursework. And in 2017, I wrote a second edition of it to incorporate some latest um, developments. This book revolves around von Neumann entropy and its variants. And there are concepts like typical subspaces that are used to prove capacity theorems. Most recently with a PhD student at LSU, Sumit Khatri, who, who you know, worked very hard and uh, I, I did as well. <laughs> we wrote a new textbook that summarizes developments from the past decade. And the focus here is on Renyi entropy and its variants. And um, we don't use typical subspaces to use to, to prove capacity theorems. We use alternative notions, okay? Um, we, we use one-shot entropy measures and um, prove properties of them to establish the capacity theorems. And so this incorporates developments from the past decade. If you want to learn about entanglement theory, I gave a series of lectures. You can see that each of them is about 15 minutes each on entanglement theory. And this gives you the, the basics of uh, entanglement theory. There's an organization called She Quantum led by a woman in India, um, and these lectures were, I, I delivered them to support their organization. Okay, final thoughts. Uh, entanglement is a key feature of quantum mechanics. Um, I tried to show you ways in which classical and quantum information are separated by entanglement. You know, entanglement's a strictly quantum concept, and it allows for amazing possibilities that are not there for classical information theory. I talked about some tasks, um, unassisted classical communication. I spent some time on that. I talked about feedback assisted communication. I also briefly talked about quantum communication. What I did not talk about was entanglement assisted communication or secret key agreement. There are bounds that we developed using ideas from information theory uh, to, to bound the rate at which secret key can be distributed over a quantum channel. And those bounds have been used as benchmarks by experimentalists trying to implement quantum key distribution. Going forward into the future, um, there's an experimental challenge to generate and store this entanglement, right? So like in developing this theory to make progress, we have to make simplifications. Like a major assumption that we make in Shannon theory is that locally fault tolerant quantum computers are available. Um, so when you actually start designing protocols, you have to lift these assumptions and um, you know, uh, that, that introduces some challenges. And so there's, there's still much work that remains to be conducted. Um, I really didn't talk at all about what 
what can be achieved with a finite number of channel uses, there's a whole theory that's developed there that's very interesting. And um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so everyone, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat window and we can take them one by one. I see there's one question already in the chat window, Mark, so if you want to take that up. Okay, so how do the question, thank you. Um, how do entangled particles communicate with each other? Um, I should clarify, okay, and then there's a follow-up question. Does entanglement violate the principle that information cannot travel faster than light? Indeed, um, there's a no signaling principle that applies to entanglement. Entanglement on its own cannot be used to transmit information. You see in these protocols that we discussed, uh, I have to go way back, sorry. Okay, for example, supernance coding, um, uh, <clears throat> we're using the entanglement in conjunction with a dynamical resource, like a qubit channel to communicate information. So here you see that it's used with something else. And in teleportation, we're using the entanglement in conjunction with a dynamical resource, the classical bits. And so in all of these communication protocols, you need entanglement along with a dynamical resource. I didn't talk about entanglement assisted communication, entanglement assisted capacity. Maybe I'll just briefly talk about it. Uh, this is the diagram that applies to entanglement assisted communication. In this model, you assume that they share entanglement beforehand, and then Alice can encode the classical message using the entanglement into systems that can be transmitted over the channel. So here, the, the, dyna the dynamical resource is the noisy channel. And so, you know, this channel has to have some capacity to be able to transmit information, even if shared entanglement is available. So, Okay, and that's an interesting point at the end of the question. Does entanglement uh, violate the principle that information cannot travel faster than light since altering the state of a particular particle will immediately alter the state of the entanglement particles millions of, millions of miles away? Let's go back to this diagram with supernance coding. And let's reemphasize a point that I made earlier. So, in this protocol, indeed, by local operations, Alice can change the global state. She can change the global state to one of the standard four Bell states. Sorry, I don't have the definition, but you can, you can look them up. They're called phi plus, phi minus, psi plus, psi minus. So those states are different. However, the local state of Bob is the same, regardless of what Alice did. So the local state is a maximum mixed state. And similarly, um, regardless of what Alice did here, the local state is still maximally mixed. Um, it's only when you have both qubits that you can figure out what the global state is. And so this has to be communicated over a large distance in order for the superdense coding protocol to work. Okay. So, um, okay. The next question, yes. yes. The next question is from Miriam. What if the noise in the system is nonlinear? What sort of noise will it be physically? Okay. Indeed, one thing I did not describe um, in the talk is the mathematical description of a quantum channel. Okay. Maybe I can write something in the chat to indicate what the mathematical description is. I'm writing it right now. Okay, hopefully this is readable. So R is a density operator, okay? And um, these Ki, uh, th these are matrices, okay? And so every quantum channel 
is a linear map that acts on a density operator. Okay, so any any physical evolution is a, uh, a linear super operator. Okay, and the only constraint that the noise has to obey is that these operators have to obey is that this sum has to be the identity. That ensures that the, this is called the trace preservation condition. And it ensures that if you input a quantum state, the output will be a legitimate quantum state, okay? Um, the form of this noise, Ki, Ki dagger also ensures that the output is a legitimate quantum state. And so that's how we um, that's how we model quantum noise, and um, it's always in this in this uh, linear formalism. Um, there can be questions of like, you know, when you said nonlinear, maybe you meant something different, um, but but this is the fundamental mathematical description, and so every every map is a linear map and there's there's a way to justify linearity from an experimental perspective i, I won't get into that um, so this is how we tackle it theoretically um, what sort of noise will it be physically well i talked about the example of the thermal channel i think this is a great example of noise because it's the kind of noise you would encounter in practice you know um, this thermal state is a Gaussian state. You know, maybe you could you could question the Gaussian assumption, um, and the environment would be um, in some non-Gaussian state. But typically, this this model is used in experiments. Okay. So we're nearly out of time, Mark. So I'll just end with one more question. Um, so at the end, you talked about kind of future work in relation to what you already know about quantum information theory. Um, much of the recent work regarding NISC devices talks about error mitigation techniques. Yeah. I was wondering whether there are kind of formal models that have been developed using quantum information theory that talk about error mitigation techniques, because there's lots of work on quantum error correction, but is there a formal theory for error mitigation? That's a great question. Um, I have not worked in this myself. I can, um, 